Okay, we'll, we'll make a start. If, if others join late, then um, they'll, they'll no doubt catch up. So welcome everybody to our second um, session on what's happening. Um, that's, this is brought to you by Orca and Mills and Reeve. And as last time, we've got um, speakers from, from both organisations. And um, just to say this session is being recorded and the will be shared afterwards um, with, with the attendees. There are subtitles at the bottom of the screen. Um, so it's just, just um, for everybody's benefit, um, to, just to let you know that that's what they are. Um, they are the automated subtitles that are provided by Zoom. So um, if there are typos, apologies, it, it picks up some weird and wonderful words sometimes. Um, so, so ignore ignore anything that's incorrect, um, but hopefully that will help others to, to enjoy the session as well. Um, we, for those who weren't here last time, I'm just going to introduce Orca and um, a little bit about Orca and Mills and Reeves so you know who the organisations are. So Orca is the world's leading independent digital health and um, evaluation and distribution organisation, enabling safe digital adoption. And Mills and Reeve provide legal and regulatory advice and support to those operating within the health, life sciences and technology sectors and are experts in digital health. So this webinar is, as I say, the second in our series of three. And we're looking at the sort of development stage, really, of your digital health solution and things to think about when you're, when you're in that stage. Um, just bear with me one moment. Yeah, just to flag and I'll, I'll remind you at the end, the final session will be on the 16th of June and that will focus on launching your solution. Um, and we have, again, speakers from Orca, Mills and Reeve and we also have a guest speaker who uh, will have, excuse me, will have launched their, uh, their brand new uh, digital health app um, by then. And so we'll be very, very recently having launched and therefore will be telling us about their journey uh, a bit of a case study which will hopefully provide some sort of real life examples for you of what they've been through. Um, you can register for the next event on the link here which will be in the slides that are circulated after the event and or you'll automatically be sent an invite as well. Um, just to introduce our speakers, so uh, my name is Charlotte Lewis, I'm a senior associate at Mills and Reeve and I specialise in commercial health and digital health. We've got Steph Caird, who's Principal Associate at Mills and Reeve, and Steph is a life sciences lawyer who has an interest in particularly in medical devices. And Simon Lee is a health economist from Orca. Um, Steph and Simon will both be presenting a short presentation each, and then we'll have a panel Q&A session at the end. Um, so please do ask any questions that you uh, would like to, put, please raise them using the Q&A box at the bottom, and we'll field them to Steph and Simon um, accordingly. Okay, so um, Steph's going to kick off with the first presentation. Um, go for it, Steph. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, welcome, everybody, and nice to have you with us this afternoon. So, as Charlotte mentioned, um, I have a particular interest in medical devices and software and apps as medical devices. Um, I've just highlighted in bullets here um, what was circulated on the invitation uh, what we're talking about in terms of medical devices um, and the reason we thought it would be helpful to talk about this is that um, although health apps and well-being apps have had a huge boom over the past couple of years there are some pitfalls potentially depending on what your intended usage of those apps is, which could very quickly swing you over the border into medical device territory, which is um, quite highly regulated. Um, Charlotte, can we go to the next slide, please? So I've tried to condense down um, <laughs> some quite complicated um, provisions that are in the current legislation. Um, and one of the key concepts that we'd always look at when we're assessing a, an app as to whether or not it's a medical device is uh, what the intended use by the manufacturer is. Um, and that intention can be 
um, shown through what you put in your label or your instructions for use or how you promote materials um, that go along with your app. Um, and we are going to be talking about promotional activities in the next session. Um, and also in your performance evaluation of the software, if, if it's clear that your intention is for a medical purpose, um, that could swing you into medical device territory. Um, and the intended use for a medical purpose includes a very wide range of things. So diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, prediction, prognosis, treatment, or alleviation of a disease. So it's, it's a fairly broad def definition. Um, and the other key concept is in a medical device um, is what happens <laughs> with the information that you get. Um, so the, the general principle is that the main activity is that it's in or on the human body. Um, it doesn't actually have to act directly on or in the human body, but what the regulators look at is whether the software or app is um, creating or modifying medical information. Um, is it calculating or quantifying or comparing data against references um, or the standard of care um, uh, to provide information about that particular patient, um, either to the patient themselves so that they can then intervene in their own treatment pathway or um, to a treating physician or other healthcare provider um, so that they can then take appropriate treatment action. Um, so um, we had this slide in the last session, but I thought it would be quite helpful to bring it up again. Um, just some examples um, where we can see um, this definition applied. So, um, for example, you've got an app on your smartwatch. Um, it sends an alarm notification to the user or their doctor when it rec recognises that there's an irregular heartbeat for, and that can be used to help detect cardiac arrhythmia if you've got a patient who, who is known to suffer from those, that issue. Um, the other one that comes up very frequently is um, software that provides insulin dose recommendations. So um, obviously we all know when, when you're treating diabetics, um, there is a, um, a, a prick test, you check what your sugar levels in your blood are, and then um, apply insulin um, dosing accordingly. Um, and there are now software apps that will help the patient um, work out the relevant dose for them and that can then be dispensed through the pump pen or, or syringe um, and but note that if your software is an accessory um, to another medical device you you can also be classified as a medical device in in itself um, so this would come into play for example if you've got um, physical devices in a hospital that are attached with sensors to a patient and you write the software that will then provide the analysis of the data that is being collected through the physical device so you can have both the physical device and the software separately each being classified as a medical device in their own right. Um, on the flip side where we where you're not straying into the territory is um, I'd like to think this basically as any kind of software that functions as a bit like a, a library card index. So uh, information systems where you're inputting data but on admissions, appointment scheduling, insurance, anything where you're archiving um, information, your, your digital library. So uh, think of it as a, a digital Rolodex of information where information is just put in and categorized and then you can access it through a search function for example but there's no modification or interpretation um, you can also have software that alters images um, just so that it's displayed better um, or in a more compatible format with the device you're viewing it on um, that 
is not considered to be a medical device because you're still using the same image. It's just a compatibility exercise. It's not improving medical functions. And then if you've got software that is intended solely for lifestyle or well-being purposes, that would also not be a medical device. So you're only really straying into um, the, the danger zone, so to speak, if your lifestyle and well-being apps start going towards the intended to um, provide support for a specific um, health uh, issue. So if you do end up in your medical device territory, um, the next couple of slides just produce a high level bullet list of various requirements that might get thrown at you. Um, if you have a medical device, I won't spend too much time on all of these because we could be here for the full hour session. And I know Simon's got some very interesting things to say um, on, on development of, of the devices and health economics um, that I don't want to deprive you of. Um, but generally, um, there's different classifications for your devices, depending on um, how intrusive it is. So class one is generally um, the, the least complicated, least invasive, least risky, whereas the class three ones are more highly regulated and you're going to need to involve an assessment body to check that everything that you've done in terms of your, your data and clinical investigations and findings aligns to the requirements in the medical device regulations. Um, so basically the higher your classification, the, the stricter the requirements are. And there will also be different safety and performance requirements for each of the different classifications. Um, but we have also got CE marking at the moment, although um, that is being replaced in Great Britain with the UK CA marking. And I'll come on to that in a second when we talk about the current regulatory landscape. Um, there's also a requirement for doing post-market surveillance. So if you have a medical device, um, keeping a record of any issues that crop up when patients are using them. Um, and then in terms of future regulations, we'll come on to this again, um, but helpful to have the definition of a UDI. Um, so previously there was no requirement to identify your medical devices and now um, following the scandals like um, the, the surgical mesh implants or, or the um, breast implants that were exploding, um, there's now going to be requirements for higher tracking um, of medical devices using uni unique identifier codes. So I'm going to touch on this very briefly because I know that Simon is going to also talk about this and we don't want to um, spend too much time on it here. But um, one of the things that you might need to be doing for a medical device um, in the development process is undertaking a clinical investigation or clinical study or clinical trial, whatever you want to call it, involving human subjects. And Generally, it's defined as a systematic investigation that involves people uh, and it's to assess the safety or the performance. Obviously, you can have both at the same time um, of a device, and that would be classified as a clinical investigation. And if you're doing a clinical investigation of a new medical device or it's an existing general device, but you're using it for a new purpose, then the general requirement is you'd need to get um, ethics committee approval from um, a, a nationally recognized ethics committee um, for the research that you're proposing, but you'd also need to notify the MHRA in advance of take, uh, undertaking the clinical investigation and it's 60 days. Um, so that's two months in advance of you, of you starting your clinical investigation. So that's something to bear in mind if you have got an app that is a medical device and you're planning something that could potentially be a clinical investigation, if you don't follow the notification requirements, you might be um, delayed by two months um, in your whole development pipeline. Um, now, there are some exemptions um, to this requirement. 
Uh, one is um, research um, with a general device if you're not testing it on people um, or if you've got a CE or UKCA marked general device and you're using it within their purpose, even if you're using it with people um, or if you've got um, an in vitro diagnostic device um, and you're doing research that hasn't got a medical objective, those things aren't um, notifiable to the MHRA. It's, it's really the new devices or de existing devices outside of their current purpose that is the key focus for them. <clears throat> so um, I'm conscious we're, we're <laughs> running out of time slowly. So just um, on medical device requirements for software, make sure that you're, when you're developing your, your software, um, make sure that it's reliable, performing in line with intended use. Um, you need to think about design com compatibility with different platforms. Um, so can it work as well on a, on a mobile phone as on a tablet, for example? Does it have to work with different operating systems? Um, which feeds into the specifying what requirements you need for your operating systems. Um, you do need the unique device identifier um, for the software and if you make any modifications to it. So think about your um, new releases as well. Okay. Um, so these were the, the medical device regulations. So we've got medical device regulation 2002 um, at the end of the transition period that we had. So we, we have these medical de device regulations um, are still in, in force. There have been amendments now to reflect that we've departed from the EU. Um, the MHRA now no longer intends to apply the EU regulations on medical devices. Um, there will be CE marking recognised until 30th of June 2023. Um, there are now no longer any EU notified bodies that are recognised by the MHRA. So if you need new certification, you have UK approved bodies that you'd need to go through for new devices. There's also a new UKCA mark, um, although that doesn't apply in Northern Ireland because of the Northern Ireland protocol where you still follow the European regime. Um, there's a requirement for device manufacturers to be registered with the MHRA. And if you're a non-UK manufacturer, you need to have a UK responsible person um, appointed. Um, we also now have the Medicines and Medical Devices Act 2021. So this flows out from recommendations from the Cumberledge Review. Um, it gives the MHRA increased enforcement powers, the priority of this piece of legislation was to ensure the safety, um, availability and, and attractiveness, attractiveness of the UK market. So there are various um, provisions that help innovators. Um, there's also a commissioner for patient safety um, and a new information center to help track and record medical device information. Um, another area of regulation just to be mindful of is if you're providing services via the app, um, because if the services you're providing are regulated activities, you might need to have CQC registration um, and the, the relevant regulated activities are in, in the Health and Social Care Act, um, regulated activities regulation um, in, includes providing medical advice remotely for example, um, or treatment of disease, disorder or injury by a, a healthcare professional or social worker where it's a mental health issue. Um, and it includes um, registered medical practitioners and nurses in the definition of healthcare professionals. Excuse me. Um, and then just briefly, because um, we, we mentioned this in the invite, um, there are various accreditations and standards now that um, people might look for in your apps. Um, and Liz did touch on this briefly in the first 
um, session. So if you have received the slides from the first session, there's a bit more detail in there, but I just thought I'd recap very briefly. Um, you've got, as well as your CE or UK CE marking, you've got various standards around um, information security uh, that would be looked at for information security and data privacy. So cyber essentials, uh, OWASP, um, ISO 27001. Um, there's also the new NHS DTAC standard, a new ISO standard that is being looked at, which is 82304. Eight, Two, and then um, there's also web contact content accessibility guidelines that you need to be mindful of, um, which is um, relates to ensuring that people with um, additional requirements can still access your online content um, properly. So I think that was a, a whistle stop tour of medical device pitfalls from me um, if you I can see there's some questions and we can pick them up um, later in the panel session or now no that's great Steph well um, there's a couple of things to cover off in the uh, the Q&A so if everyone's okay we'll continue with Simon's presentation and then we'll um we'll we'll, we'll ask you some questions together yeah. that's all right. i think i'll just answer one very quick quickly which is um i've had a a point on the the new eu regulations um just that, that they do come into force um i think either yesterday or today um so for the eu based uh, applications um Thanks, Steph. Uh, Simon, do you want to share your screen? Wonderful. That's just coming up now. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're, you're so much, I'm, my name is Simon Lee. I'm a health economist. And I'm the head of research at the Organisation for the Review of Care and Health Applications, ORCA. Um, so you may have heard of ORCA. We previously worked quite closely with NHS Digital and NHS Act. And ORCA work as basically a group who collect standards in digital health. We bring them all into one place and try to align them all together so that it's a one-stop shop for you having your technology set in various standards to save you having to go independently to, to each one and to save, basically to save overlap. So we, we try and pull in all of the relevant standards together and give you know, digital health innovators an idea of where their top technology may be lacking, where they may stand to be improved, where they're in good shape, and basically how we can help improve these both from a, a clinical and an economic perspective, ultimately to, to demonstrate that and showcase the true value of any technology. Now, what I'm showing today is very, very much, it's worth stating, you know, a whistle-stop tour of, um, of health economics and benefits realisation and why this is really important to consider all the way through your, you know, your, your planning and development of your, your health technology. So we're just going to start off with a very brief look at how you may demonstrate benefit and unlock, you know, the power of your digital health technology. And there's plenty of ways that you can do this. And that there have been historically, you know, apps use very, very varying um, approaches to this, but it ultimately depends on the functionality of the app. So you can use data where you're actively committing to user surveys, to collecting relevant patient reported outcome measures, or other relevant outcomes within an app and saying patient X started using this app here. By the time they got to point Y, the difference in outcomes was, was Y minus X. Therefore that was down to the app. That's really handy. It doesn't take account of obviously what may have occurred in natural history, what may have occurred without the app. So again, having comparators though is actually quite important as well. You start moving towards more of an RCT. Uh, we can also use retrospective data for a lot of apps. We don't need to gild the lily and spend an absolute fortune on RCTs if the function of the app doesn't really warrant an RCT. If I've got an app that teaches children how to brush their teeth for the correct amount of time, or I've got an app that teaches the elderly how to perform yoga in order to keep them limber, prevent falls, these don't really require RCTs because the risks of these not working and not as severe as what was touched on earlier, such as the diabetes app that gives you the wrong amount of insulin. That's quite, that is quite serious. And although obviously yoga technique may be quite serious if done incorrectly, all things being equal, it's significantly less risky than a melanoma checker or an insulin adjustment app. So 
different apps require different types of evidence. And that, that's really important here. So, and that leads us on to benchmarking. So some apps with certain functionalities, which I'll touch on later, you can actually benchmark with other technologies that have done this and said, well, my app's exceptionally similar to this app here. And this app's had a study and this app's been quality approved. It's exactly the same mode of action. Mine's just got a shiny front skin on it. And that, that is also permissible in some cases. And finally, testimony, which is, which is a nice to have, but most of the time is, is quite useless in terms of um, actually demonstrating value. Issue being that 100 people can give testimonies and get 100 completely different answers. Um, they are useful to determine the why as to why something has happened, but in, in determining the what, as in what has this app actually done and how can I put a value on this, they are limited in some respect. Now, for me, there are five steps to unlocking the value of digital health. Others, others may disagree, but these are the five that we use at Orca. And they're quite simple steps. It's collecting and analyzing patient level data of people who have used your technology to see how things have changed. Mapping out your competition so that you can compare what people using your technology have done, how their outcomes have improved, how their symptoms have been abated, and comparing that to, okay, what would have been done in the absence? What's the current standard of care? What will people be getting otherwise? And is there an added value of my app actually above and beyond? Because a lot of people go into this thinking that their technology is the best things in sliced bread, but it's better to know early if what you're providing isn't actually that much value or if you need to work on areas to make it more valuable. Taking account of uncertainty is really important. So when you do develop any of this data and you're looking at how your app works, it's appreciating that not everyone's the same. If I've got a weight loss app, it's bound to be far more effective for people that have a BMI of 50 plus than it is for people who have a BMI of 10. There's a different inherent difference in ability to lose weight there. Similarly, if my app helps to improve blood sugar, it's much more likely to work for those with a HbA1c over 10 than it is for those with a really tight HbA1c of 6. So again, it's taking account of those that heterogeneity and those observable differences so that you can really hone in on the patients that have the greatest difference in, in outcomes. And that's what's really important with segmentation. So picking a target group to start with, to get your technology into either the NHS or another healthcare authority, where the value is the greatest. We see this in pharma a lot. We don't go in in pharma, which is predominantly where I work, and say, I want this drug to be given to everybody with this condition, because it would never work. It would bankrupt the NHS. We start with a very small group, a very small population of a very clear and defined benefit, and then look to extend licenses from there to creep, the, to creep it out into the NHS wider and different cohorts. And it's the same here. We need to find the, the cohorts that have the greatest value from using this technology, so that ultimately we can justify the expenditure and paying for it. Now, thanks to NICE, for me personally, I, I do genuinely believe this, it's never been easier to know exactly what type of evidence you require. Um, until about two years ago, it was a bit of a wild west. You would invest money, hard-earned money, and money that could probably be put to better use elsewhere, such as making sure you hit the right you know, accreditations and regulations, even marketing or product development. We want to make sure that this money is put to the best use. So now when it comes to evidence and health economics, it's very clear what type of evidence you actually require. So if you're a tier one app, which is a system service, this is like um, the equivalent of the red book for children when they get their vaccinations and you keep a, a log of their height and weight, that's a system service. There's not a lot that, that can go wrong there. There's not much information, not much communication. It's very simple. So this is very low risk and has very low evidence requirements as a result. We're not gonna ask you to do an RCT of what is in essence a journal. Now tier two, this gets a bit more complicated. These are things that can inform you, that can monitor conditions and that can communicate. So this may inform me as a type one diabetic that I should only eat certain foods or that the caloric intake from certain foods is higher than others. If I have IBD, it might recommend a FODMAP diet to me and warn me of certain foods. Now there's moderate risk inherent to this because if it tells me the wrong information, I may have a flare up or I may not take enough insulin. So there is a moderate risk there. And we do need pragmatic evidence for this. We need some form of observational data. And then finally, you've got tier three, the big boys, you know, the medical devices, those that prevent, manage, treat, calculate, and diagnose. And these have significant risk attached to them. This is your, 
your insulin adjustment apps, your melanoma trackers. And these are the ones that obviously we do require a higher form of evidence, a high quality observational study or a randomized control trial in order to be absolutely certain that they do what they say on the tin and that ultimately you first do no harm if recommending these. Now, this approach, I don't know if you can see this at the top of the, the ribbon. Let's see if we can see it, if I can hide the ribbon. Uh, no, I can't. So they're broken down into handy little tiers, foo nice. And if you look at the nice ESF, it's now being broken down even further into just tier one, tier two, and tier three. And you can work out precisely what level of evidence you require so that when you're investing your own funds or those of an investor, you know exactly what to go for. You're not gilding the lily, but ultimately you're not selling yourself short either. And this is really important if, if you're new to evidence and if you're not an expert in collecting clinical and or economic evidence, being told exactly what to collect, how to collect it, and the outcomes to collect against really can help you in that, in that benefits realization pathway and ultimately in that roadmap to reimbursement. Now, how do I actually do this in practice? So NICE, obviously they, their, their preference is what's called cost consequence analysis. And I'm sure everyone's heard of cost effectiveness analysis and cost effectiveness analysis is a branch of cost consequence analysis in essence. And it's, as it says on the tin, we look at the costs and we look at the consequences of using a technology because ultimately if I'm gonna fund this from a healthcare perspective, I need to know what the technology actually does for me as a provider. I need to know whether it's actually doing anything worthwhile for my patients. Can't just assume that it does. I need this evidence. So we need to look at economic outcomes like costs, a &E admissions, inpatient admissions, doctor appointments, out of hours, things that cost the NHS money and that takes money away from patients where it could possibly put to be, be put to better use elsewhere, such as COVID vaccinations. We need to look at health service changes. So waiting times, consultation times, wastage even, or others such as equity. Does it provide access to to healthcare in groups who are currently not served well by incumbent services? Are there short-term health gains in quality of life, in pain management, in diagnosis speed, if it's mental health, waiting times and disease outcomes, such as HbA1c, FEV1, et cetera? And finally, are there long-term benefits that you can associate with this technology, such as survival, quality adjusted life years, and how sustainable are these? These are your big ticket items. If you can find an app that can improve survival in a group or that can generate quality adjusted life years, you, you're, gonna be on, you're gonna be on the yellow brick road to, to success with these. Now, when you look at this in practice, it's actually quite simple. All we're trying to do is look at what your technology does compared to what would be done otherwise. So there's an example here for IAPT for mental health. Uh, people typically on IAP pathways have to wait a long time in order to see a trained psychotherapist or a counsellor. There's high demand, shortage in supply, leads to long waiting times. In some places, these are as long as about 120 days. So it's a serious wait. This was um, a study looking at what an app may do while waiting to see a psychotherapist. And this was based in Cheshire. So in Cheshire, I think there was about, yeah, there was, there was a 47 day wait to see a psychotherapist. If we waited to see the psychotherapist under the current standard of care, the cost would be approximately £1,000. Now, that was taken into account the fact that we'd require seven sessions of therapy and the GP appointment, and there's a risk inherent there of exacerbation and having a serious flare-up and ending up in A&E with a crisis. And finally, there's a GAD7 reduction. This is your actual outcomes, the thing that the healthcare providers care about. If I was a mental health care provider, I'd care about GAD7. This is the reduction in, in anxiety. Now, if we look at an app while waiting, this was delivered after one day. We saw the GP, we got the app. It cost £250 in this study because in that 47-day wait that you'd have otherwise, people were, were, continue, were stopping themselves from getting worse. They were learning strategies which they, they could put to good use when they actually saw a trained professional. So it reduced the need for face-to-face -face therapy. And their GAD7 reduction as a result was much higher because they'd had a continual reduction in symptoms rather than waiting for 47 days and then having a sharp reduction. So when we look at the total GAD7 reduction and the total cost, it's about £30 per point reduction, whereas under the current standard of care, it's 160. So we can say here beyond any reasonable doubt that, and that's the important thing, reasonable doubt, there is some reasonable doubt here, that, that the app is five times more cost effective than current services based on this cohort of individuals. So why wouldn't you fund it? It's cheaper it's quicker and it's better. And these are the things that you need to take account. And this GAD7 
was a nationally recognized outcome for anxiety in these patients. So it was using an outcome that was already collected in routine practice so that we could compare the app with what's actually being done already in the NHS. Now, if we take an example in emergency care for a newly diagnosed lady here with type 1 diabetes, this new technology can help provide her with, with coping strategies and examples of what to eat, what not to eat, how to take her insulin, how not to exercise too much in the, those first two months post-diagnosis when you're a bit uncertain. And the idea here was that the app reduced the likelihood of hypo and hyperglycemia by keeping her well controlled for a longer period of time. By giving this information, our study showed that hypo and hyperglycemia the, was reduced by about 20%. So the app reduced hypoglycemia by about 20% and hyperglycemia by 30%. And what we did is we said, OK, if people were hypoglycemic, they could potentially go to hospital or they may not get hospitalized. But if they do get hospitalized, there's a chance that it's by ambulance. But there's a greater chance that it's by a family member who's worried who takes them in the car. But these are all important because an ambulance conveyance costs £325. A cost for hospital admission for just one day costs £500. So if I can reduce either of those by 10%, that's a £50 or £32.50 saving per user. So we run, the, we run the numbers on this and we saw that as the reduction hypoglycemia from the app went up, the amount of money that the app saved went up. So if the app cost one pound and reduced hypoglycemia by 50%, it saved the NHS 40 pounds. And that tells us our ceiling price for the app. You charge any more than 40 pounds for this app per patient and the NHS actually loses money. So it loses health. It'd be better investing that money elsewhere. It loses more than it gains. If the app costs 10 pounds, and it reduces hypoglycemia by 50%, we'll pay £24 for it. It starts to give you an indication of what you can get away with for pricing, ultimately with, with CFOs and when you're going through procurement. It's value-based pricing. And this is, this is you know, inherent to pharmaceuticals, and it's really important within health apps and digital health as well, because if you go in with a price too high, you just quite simply will not get funded. It's, it's that simple. We need to be able to demonstrate the value of actually doing this. So coming back to uncertainty, if we come back to our original example of mental health and say, well, what if the clinicians recommending or delivering the service aren't representative of those in the real world? What if they're more inherently invested? What if the patients included were self-selected and were most likely to succeed? And what if we overall underestimated the cost of existing care? So we go back to our analysis and we say, okay, the cost actually is twice as much for the app because we need that extra, another couple of sessions of therapy. The wait's three days because there's a bit of admin to get it over the line and sort out the cost. And the GAD7 as a reduction is a bit lower. And the waitlist fry app has been reduced significantly because there's been other social prescribing measures in the area. The GAD7 reduction from the waitlist has, as a result, gone up and the costs have gone down. So then when you compare the cost effectiveness, this is still more cost effective, but only just. There's only about £20 in it. So that really erodes a lot of that benefit, which means as a result, the price that you can afford to get away with goes down. Now, this is the important thing about sensitivities. If you change your assumptions, it's important to make sure that they don't change the outcome of the return on investment calculation. If they change the outcome from an, from an invest to do not invest, from a use to do not use, you have a problem there, but it tells you which areas you need to focus any ongoing research and data collection on. So if I learn that the proportion who are reduced, let's say the proportion to reduce hypoglycemia at 30%, the app's worthwhile and I pay 50 quid for it. But at 10%, I wouldn't pay for it. That tells me that I need to look at evidence to ensure that my app can deliver at least a 10% reduction in hypoglycemia because that's the outcome measure that's driving the value of my app and ultimately how much I'm going to be able to sell this for and license it in. And then finally, very quickly, I know I'm going slightly over segmentation. I cannot stress the importance of this enough. IVF has a 5% effectiveness in women over 42. 5%. But in women under 40, it's 75% effective. So it's 15 times more effective and 15 times more cost effective in women under 40. Does that mean that we shouldn't give it to women, does that mean that because it only has a 5% effectiveness in women under 42, we shouldn't give it to women under 40? No, it doesn't. What it means is that it's far more effective to divert our scarce NHS resources to women under 40. So we're getting a 15 fold improvement in the value there. And obviously taking account the ethical concerns here and the quality of life and you know the fact that these are hard decisions, this technology IVF is 15 times more cost effective in women under 40. So that's where I'm gonna go.
if I want funding. Similarly with an app, if my app is proven to be more effective in younger people versus older people, in people who are newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes versus those that have had it for about six months, I'm going to focus on the groups where my value is highest because I'm going to be able to get the greatest improvement in outcomes and I'm going to be able to achieve the greatest price there. And my value proposition is going to be far greater for those patients. And once I've got into the NHS and I've got a clinical champion, somebody who's helping me along the way with this implementation, clinical champion, I'm then going to be able to expand further into other groups once I'm comfortable in the NHS and I'm procured and I'm safe. And I've got a rolling contract. And this is the final thing to talk about. Getting a clinical champion is absolutely paramount for, for any of these. You know, if you're going to run health economic studies and even clinical studies, having a clinical champion it is so important. We run a study in, and it was published in the Lancet Digital um, last year or the year before now, I can't remember. And it would take two published studies to be as convincing as a single healthcare provider recommending to another healthcare provider. And that's your key, having healthcare providers recommend these technologies to patients or to other healthcare providers. But it would take five published studies to be as convincing as an NHS or NICE or MHRA stamp of approval. So it's focusing on the things that matter and making sure that we gain those things that matter so that this, this roadmap to reimbursement is much smoother. And I'll leave you there with that. But if you do have any questions, obviously you can get in contact at Orca Health and hello at Orca, and we'll be able to help you further there. But thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Um, the, the next slide I've got is, is, is literally just a picture of the three of us with our names. And seeing as you've got that already um, on, on screen, hopefully, I'm not going to pop the slide up. I thought you might want to see uh, see us all a bit bigger live as opposed to uh, still pictures. Um, so we've got about uh, 15 minutes for uh, Q&A. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to open up with a question from Stephen Brown. Um, and it's probably for, for Steph, but very happy for you to chip in if, if you'd like, Simon. Steph, have you seen that question? Yeah, I have. Um, and it, it's, it's a really helpful observation from, from Stephen. Um, it was to, to clarify the point that I made earlier about when software is not a medical device. And I was talking about um, adjusting an, an image for... Um, compatibility purposes so um, Stephen has has rightly pointed out that um, if you've got medical software that is medical image display for diagnostic purposes that would fall within the me medical device sphere um, what I was what I was talking about was if you've got a software that is um, taking an image and, and it's just um, adjusting or, or rather transferring the data in a way that makes it visible on another uh, platform. So it's it's a system that uh, is solely transferring the data from the image um, or transforming it so that it can be tra uh, transferred rather than it is being displayed in a way that will allow diagnostics. It's, it's, a, it's a slightly complicated um, distinction and, and quite fine. Um, but but my my point is that if you're just adjusting for compatibility purposes, um, and Steve, Stephen has just very kindly also said that um, it, it's to help with um, teleconferencing like Zoom. Um, so Steve obviously knows and uses this technology quite a lot um, in his day day to day life. Um, so yeah, thank thank you very much um, for for adding in that clarification. I hope that I have managed to summarise that um, properly. So it's uh, things that are being displayed for diagnostic purposes. Software that displays for diagnostic purposes would be a medical device. But if it's software that is taking an image and transferring it for the purposes of compatibility, that would not necessarily be a medical device. So I hope that has answered <laughs> or clarified things a bit. It is a very complicated area. And I think, you know, if anyone's got any specific questions, if they want to know whether their product may or may not be a medical device, um, then there's obviously, a, a, you know, processes you can go through to check that. And I think uh, both Steph and 
um, and, and people at Orca can support with that. So obviously get in touch if, if anyone's got any particular sort of concerns or specific examples they'd like some, some help with. Um, the next question was for Simon, and just in relation to, you know, you're, you're a health economist, at what point in this process or developers or organisations looking at using digital health solutions get health economists involved? Okay, so from from personal experience over the years, I, I'd say as, as early as as early as possible, really, because you don't need to involve a health economist massively at an early stage, just even a little bit of advice would go a long way in this. And the, the reason is that health economics is often seen as, as a bolt-on at the end. It's let's get the clinical done first. Let's make sure all this is safe. And then we'll bolt it on and do it at the end. Whereas, whereas now we've seen the regulations changing and, you know, groups such as the NAHR and SBRI, you're needing health economics as a, you know, as an absolute. So you must have that in order to secure funding for future evaluations. So it's really important that in order to recognize the landscape and to make sure that your health economics is, is included and to not just focus on the clinical effectiveness, which may be fantastic, but on the actual cost effectiveness. You know, there's, there's no point focusing too heavily on whether this makes a difference if that difference isn't really that important in the first place to the NHS, which sounds quite crass, but you know, it's, it's really important to get in at the early stage and make sure that the outcomes that you're assessing and that the, the things that you're looking at are actually the things that matter because you don't want to get too far down the line and then have to try and start again when you say, oh, actually, I've collected all this data, but it doesn't match up with the NHS standard of care, so I can't really compare. You know, it's... it's it's really important to start early because the, the smoothest processes are those that are considered from every perspective from start to finish. One thing that sort of sprung to my mind when we're, we're talking about that, and, and it might not be something that either of you can um, sort of answer today, but is, is in relation, you know, we hear a lot about the digital divide um, and just listening to, to your comments, um, Simon, and, and the idea that, you know, certain things might not be from a cost health economy perspective you might not be particularly attractive to um you know ha have an app that's designed at being used by a certain group uh, you know population um because they won't you won't use it how do you think that feeds into sort of the, this this concept of the digital divide and if things move more to a digital sort of footing ensuring that people we don't lose patients and, and people along on that journey no it's, it's a really it's a really good question actually there's a lot of there's a lot of debate at the moment around the, you know, the ethics of, of digital health and equity and because digital health is always sold as it can improve access. But in actual fact, like you say, it may actually widen the divide where those who are already well served get another technology, whereas those who are probably less served don't. Um, Unfortunately, the way that this is addressed is through social care funding, which I know is non-existent. So it's, re it's really difficult here, but obviously in general, local different CCGs do have different imperatives. Some have an imperative to really you know, promote weight loss. Others have an imperative to really extend access to, to vulnerable and hard to reach groups. So this is, this is very much being careful about where you position this because you are right in terms of health economics, it's particularly insensitive. It's the greatest good for the greatest number, regardless of who that number is consisting of. And that's unfortunately just the way it is in that we value everybody's health equally, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's, whether it's a 16 year old girl or whether it's a 45 year old man, if we get an improvement in health, that value, that value is equal across both of those individuals. So it's really important that going forward, and again, this was one of the cost consequence ideas before, equity is a really important outcome. If, if improving access and horizontal equity so that those with equal need get equal access to care is your outcome measure, it's really important to get that in your analysis because if you have two technologies to choose from as a CFO, you've got your app, which has a rough similar cost effectiveness to a another technology. If yours also improves access to hard to reach groups, and that's the thing that will push you over the top. And it's also about new strategies to get these groups engaged as well. And there, there's a lot of literature out there now about particular strategies and particular technologies that can be used by hard to reach groups. And that's really, that's really interesting. I suppose, I think what I think is really interesting there is to say to those you know, in the audience who are um, looking at opportunities, 
it might be that actually just because something seems on the face of it like it, you know it might not be the you know might might be that you're targeting digital solutions for older people who might not necessarily use if you can hit that market in the right way actually that's you know you're potentially opening up a, a lucrative um, resource uh, income stream as well as helping a particular um, population who might have previously missed out um, and I take our older generation as purely as an example there so so there's sort of, sort of um, risk for opportunity wherever that wherever risk sits thank you I think the um, next two questions um, so, so just to add from a from a regulatory perspective I think that they've been trying very hard to push um, the requirements around accessibility for websites and apps and I know um, that started off with um, government sector websites and, and apps, um, but is now becoming increasingly a requirement for any consumer facing products. Um, so I think they are trying to address the issue from a legislative um, angle as well to try and help uh, people with visual or hearing difficulties be able to access the same kind of online resources um, as others but obviously that's an additional kind of cost requirement that you need to factor in when you're developing your products. Yeah, thanks. thanks very much. Um, so Wesley has asked a couple of questions I think they are probably for you Simon are you okay to, to pick both of those up? Of course yeah. So, uh, so the first question is, can you explain further the difference you're seeing between 3A and 3B DHT and who has the final say? And then the second question probably wrapped up is, when does the DHT become the standard course of care? Absolutely. So with regards to the first question, 3A versus versus 3B, this is, this is really interesting because NICE have very recently changed their guidance on this. And the, imp the implementation of this is different in different groups. So... 3A and 3B are now about to be recombined into what's called a TSC, the ABC, where we're taking into account a variety of, of functionalities here from prevention to monitoring, monitoring to treatment. And the answer on who has the final say on this is ultimately to look at the guidance now from NICE and look at this their step-by-step -step guidance. If you meet any of the criteria for a TSC, which is a 3A or a 3B, you will fall into that category and be expected to have that, that evidence. It's, it's that simple. If you don't hit any of those categories, but you hit those for a tier B, which is a, a tier two, then you'll fall into that one. Groups such as Orca can help you go through this and can look at what your technology does, look at the functions and features, break it down and say, look, based on this, this and this, we believe you're a tier C, therefore you'd be expected to do this. However, if you removed or tweaked or altered this functionality, you may then fall into a tier B. So you'd have a far lower evidentiary requirement. It's generally the best way to do this is to go to a, go to an accreditor or a regulator, someone who's used to these technologies to help you to walk you through this and to make sure that you are covering everything that you need. And for your second question, when does the DHT become the standard course of care? Um, that's really interesting. And I think the honest answer is that it's never happened today where the DHT has become the standalone source of care. DHTs, I think, are, are always carefully positioned as an adjunct, as a supplement, as something in addition to existing care. There are specific instances where DHTs may be recommended first line, and if unsuccessful, people are then stepped up to, to additional perhaps face-to-face -face or pharmacologic treatments. But in general, I think if we're being honest, we have a long way to go before DHTs are considered the standard, the standard of care here because there's still so much reluctance to using digital health technologies. If you think even from a sorry, one second, <coughs> if you think even from a healthcare provider perspective, we're still in a situation where healthcare providers aren't taught as to the, the potential value and benefits of digital health within their routine medical training. This still isn't included within medical training, how to use, how to have critically appraise health apps and digital health. So it's going to be many, many years, if not decades, I would say, before M Health and digital health is considered the standard of care. And I think even then it's going to be in very select groups where, where it makes sense to, to use this first. But COVID has undoubtedly shifted this forward significantly. The speed, this has gone forward a, a hell of a long way. If you look at... Um, consultations we were talking before about zoom 
the use of consultations for GP for GPs has, has skyrocketed recently. I don't think it'll ever be the standard of care. I think it's one of many standards of care. And it's for the right individual to pick the right intervention that's right for them. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Steph, Steve's asked a question about medical devices and medical device regulations uh, and the fact that we know the UK has um, opted out of following the, um, the EU to implement the medical device regulations and is now defaulting to be regulated by the 1933 um, I assume that's the medical device directive. Um, do you have an impression on what changes the UK government may make to update this very out-of-date directive that is not really fit for purpose in today's cloud web app or mobile dominated world? Um, yeah, so, so for England, Scotland and Wales, um, that is correct. So we've got the Medical Device Regulations 2002, which implement, implement the Medical Device Directive. Um, we also now have the Medicines and Medical Devices Act 2021, um, which has got some changes in it um, relating to um, enforcement um, by the MHRA. It also gives the Secretary of State for Health um, powers to uh, implement changes more swiftly through secondary legislation. Um, which could see us um, implementing some things that are similar to the, the EU medical device regs. Um, and there, I think, was specifically a piece around trying to support innovation in, in the UK relating to AI use. Um, but I'd need to um, read into that again. But, but basically, the, the, the new Act, so the 2021 Act, um, has been put in place to try and give our regulators the powers to adjust things a bit more quickly, um, rather than having to go through the, the rigmarole that is necessary, obviously, if you're changing EU level legislation, which the MDR is. Um, so we're anticipating that there will be some changes that will hopefully make the UK market um, a bit more flexible and more attractive for innovators in the in the AI um, and, and digital space. Um, but obviously we need to wait and see what happens there. Um, so I hope, hope that answers that question um, and I'm happy to have a, a, a further look at anything AI specific, specific um, and follow up. Thanks, um, thanks for that Steph. Um, we, we're coming to time now so I'm going to wrap up. I know Wesley you've asked a question about when will the NHS go paperless. I think um, there's lots of NHS organisations are already paperless, um, but the, the, the extent to which individual organisations are fully paperless varies across the board. Um, I'm not aware of anything that, that necessarily requires it um, in a particular deadline, although I have just had a little search um, of a popular search engine, which has come up with the figure 2023. But of course, as many people, most people know, the NHS is not one single thing, it's made up of multiple organisations. And so it will depend upon, um, you know, all of the constituents parts being paperless in order to work seamlessly and um, so I, I'll keep a lookout for, for any guidance but um, the, the latest sort of publications has been certainly the health service journal last August said that the um, uh, that, that it's not going to happen for a, a while and um, so thank you all for attending today thank you to Simon and to Steph for sharing their um, insights and um, expertise Thank you for asking questions and engaging in the in the discussion. Um, if you'd like to attend the, the final session, then um, you'll receive an invite following this. It'll probably be um, early next week. You'll receive a recording and a, an invitation to the next session. Immediately after uh, this session, a pop-up will um, 
uh, will show with some feedback. We'd be really grateful if you could complete that. It helps us to plan the next session and further sessions, um, particularly those in relation to digital health, which we assume you're all quite interested in. So um, keep it to time. Thank you all very, very much for, for joining and we hope to see you at the next session. And thanks once again to Simon and Lee. Uh, Steph, sorry, Simon and Steph. Steph won't be at our next session, sadly, because she goes off to... Um, um, I hope she doesn't mind me saying she's going off on maternity leave. So um, we, this is the last time we'll see Steph um, in this series. So thank you very much, Steph, for your contributions. They're all gratefully received. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, yeah. everyone, for coming.